Hello everyone, uh, my name is Linda van Beek. I'm the Executive Director of Global Compact Network Netherlands. Uh, welcome to this webinar uh, with the title Fostering SDG Alignment uh, of SMEs, A Path to Financial Success. Um, I'm pleased to welcome you on behalf of Global Compact Network Netherlands and also on, on behalf of our partner, uh, the Netherlands British Chamber of Commerce. Uh, we consider N uh, NBCC as a very important partner in our mission to accelerate and upskill the positive impact of business on the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, NBCC plays a massive role in the Netherlands-British uh, uh, business relation, and we really support their decision uh, to put sustainability um, uh, uh, to, to, to give sustainability a prominent role in their strategy and their, in, in their agenda. Uh, last week, uh, the, role, the whole world looked at the UK. Uh, many people watched the impressive, impressive state funeral of Queen, of Queen Elizabeth. Our thoughts are, of course, also with the British people. It was Queen Elizabeth uh, who said during the Commonwealth Heads of Government in 2009, and that threat to our environment is not a new concern, but it is now a global challenge, which we will continue to affect the security and stability of millions for years to come. And she decided to take her own responsibility. And as a landowner, the royal family uh, had been granting licenses to off uh, offshore wind farms. It is exactly this global challenge uh, which we would like to discuss today. Tomorrow, we will celebrate the seventh anniversary of the Sustainable Development Goals. These global goals have laid down concrete targets to respond uh, to the global challenges. Goals that can, can't be reached only by governments, uh, but that require impact also from civil society and business. Uh, SME companies might be occupied by all kinds of daily business challenges, especially in these turbulent times, uh, these times of uncertainty, for example, due to the increased uh, energy prices and a lower purchase, purchasing power, uh, entrepreneurs are facing a dynamic time. But right now, in these times of uncertainty, anticipating on the global challenges and drive business in the direction of more long-term value creation will be important. It's also a manner for companies uh, 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 to work on their own re resilience. On a daily basis, I meet uh, SME companies that are working hard to accelerate uh, their positive impact on environment and society. And in many cases, also these companies are asking actually uh, for help. Uh, for example, what is the meaning of the many legislative development uh, measures and developments on sustainability? Uh, for example, sustainability due diligence legisl legislation or uh, legislation on sustainable reporting. And how can they use also their role in the supply chain to accelerate on the sustainable development goals? Uh, one of the priorities uh, in the strategy of Global Compact Net Network Netherlands is the activation of the, uh, of the SMEs. Uh, it is also uh, a UN Global Compact presented an SME strategy uh, last year. I can really recommend uh, to, to have a look at that. Um, this webinar is one of the activities uh, in this context, uh, but we also do more. For example, there are uh, free e-learning courses uh, from the uh, UN Global Compact Academy, especially uh, tailor-made for SME companies. Um, an initiative of Global Compact Network Netherlands is also the development, development of a digital, digital SME uh, SDG tool. Uh, a tool uh, which will give concrete handles uh, uh, to reach more positive impact on the sustainable development goals. And hopefully we can present uh, this tool uh, at a future event. Uh, but for now, we want to give inspiration and information on how SMEs uh, can respond to sustainability expectations from investors, government and other stakeholders. Um, for example, the ESG regulations that they are facing and also how the sustainable development goals can help companies to measure progress on sustainability and also how they can make it uh, more transparent. It's not only a question for the SME companies themselves, uh, but for the whole supply chain. 
We are pleased to have here in this webinar experts from uh, PwC, Clifford Chance, Emma Safety Footwear, and Invest NL. And we will give answers to these questions. I would like the floor, to give the floor now to uh, Evelyn Spitteler. Uh, she is Senior Manager uh, ESG uh, at PwC. Uh, she has uh, specialized in the field of sustainability finance uh, and also uh, in non-financial reporting. Uh, she will give an introduction to the topic and uh, will also moderate uh, uh, the panel discussion. Uh, the floor is yours, Evelyn. Thank you, Linda. Thank you for the introduction and thank you for having me here today. Um, as you mentioned, my name is Evelyn Spitteler. Uh, I'm a senior manager at PricewaterhouseCoopers in the Netherlands. Um, and I support my clients with the implementation of sustainable finance regulations coming from the European Union, um, which are regulations to increase transparency and to attract private funding to sustainable investments in order to achieve net zero in 2050. Um, in this position, I've seen the issues companies may face when starting to implement the ESG in their core businesses and in their reporting, but also the benefits of telling a transparent ESG story. Uh, I'll start today's webinar with an introduction to SDG and to regulatory reporting developments. And subsequently, our three panelists will be invited to the floor for an interactive panel session. We have three uh, panelists today. Uh, the first will be Andrea van Dijk. She's ESG officer at InvestNL, which is the Dutch government-owned venture capital impact investment firm. She'll speak about the implementation of ESG policy in the investment process and data challenges. Second, Angela McEwen, partner at Clifford Chance and a member of the Global ESG Board, will talk about developments in ESG products she sees in the market and ESG due diligence requirements. The last panelist of today will be dialing in from the United States, so it's an early morning for her. Uh, that's Iris van Wanderooy. She's Program Manager, Corporate Social Responsibility at Emma Safety Footwear, and she's declared Dutch SDG pioneer of 2022 by Global Compact Network the Netherlands. She will talk about ESG reporting, including selecting SDGs and KPIs and supply chain due diligence. Unfortunately, due to personal circumstances, our fourth panelist, Arthur van Gerven, board member and chief sustainability officer of Berberg Adventure Capital, is not able to join the panel today. Uh, but we hope to invite him soon to one of our future events. After the panel discussion, uh, we have set 15 minutes aside to answer any questions you might have. And during the webinar, you're able to post your questions in the Q&A section of, the, of this tool. Um, and we have some moderators that will look into the questions and then we'll ask them to the, to the panelists after the panel discussion. Okay, with the administrative side, uh, Aside, set aside, I will move on to the introduction to SDG and to the regulatory reporting developments in the European Union. Thank you. So our planet is rich in natural resources, such as food, energy, and water. And these natural resources are essential for human development. However, world consumption of the natural resources has increased rapidly over time, and we are overusing many of those resources. This has created a series of interconnected challenges such as climate change, poverty and equality that need to be solved urgently. The sustainable, sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs, were adopted by the United Nations in 2015 as a universal call to action to end poverty, protect the planet and to ensure that by 2030 all people enjoy peace and prosperity. All 193 member states, including the Netherlands and the UK, committed to mobilize efforts to end all forms of poverty, fight inequalities and tackle climate change, while ensuring that no one is left behind. Probably those 17 SDGs come familiar to you. Uh, you've seen them more often probably uh, used by governments, but also more and more by private companies that have adopted the SDGs and are also committed to uh, reaching the goals of those SDGs. The 17 SDGs are interconnected, so they recognize that action in one area will affect outcomes in others, and that development must balance social, economic, and environmental sustainability. Well, as you can see on a picture, we have put the 17 SDGs here, but you see they all are interconnected and have um, will impact each other when you tackle one or the other. 
Various studies suggest that a key factor in achieving sustainable development, and with that the SDGs, is through implementing corporate social responsibility and systemic sustainability in the private sector. Because SMEs make up for more than 90% of the private sector business and economic activity in both developed and developing countries. So that's why today we talk with our panelists about how SMEs can support the achievement of the SDGs, but also how the SDGs and related reporting about it can benefit the SMEs in their growth and in their financing. I'll first go into a bit more detail about the regulatory efforts to deliver on the SDGs, since that's my uh, a specialism, um, but the panelists are more than happy to talk about the SME side of the of the story. A lot of numbers on this slide, uh, a lot of details on this slide, but this slide is about the European Green Deal. Because one way the European Union is planning to deliver on the SDGs is through the EU Green Deal. The European Green Deal is a set of policy initiatives by the European Commission with the overarching aim making the European Union climate neutral in 2050, in line with the Paris Agreement. There are also interim goals set, such as a 55% cut in greenhouse gas emissions by 2030, and at least a 32% share for renewable energy. The EU Green Deal led to the EU Action Plan on financing sustainable growth. One of the main objectives of the EU Action Plan on financing sustainable growth is to reorient capital flows from the private market towards sustainable investments, since they found that public funding, so funding from governments, from NGOs, etc., is not sufficient to achieve the goals set in the EU Green Deal. And that's where the private companies, uh, large undertakings, but also SMEs, come into play. And among other initiatives, uh, part of the EU Green Deal and the EU Action Plan for Sustainable Financing, the EU has issued three regulations to achieve this objective that might already affect you or will affect you in the near future. Um, first one is the SFDR. It's, it's, we use a lot of acronyms in the field of sustainable finance. And the SFDR is the Sustainable Finance Disclosure Regulation. Uh, for improved disclosure on green financial products to prevent greenwashing. The disclosure requirements mostly affect financial institutions, such as financial market participants and financial advisors, because they have to uh, categorize their products on how green they are, whether they're gray, light green or dark green, um, to prevent greenwashing. However, those financial institutions will probably most likely need information from their investees about how sustainable those companies are. And that's where the, the, the corporates and the SMEs will come into play. The second regulation that I want to briefly touch upon is the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, the CSRD. So the CSRD is implemented to increase the availability of sustainability information through external reporting. So you can compare it with um, IFRS, Dutch Gap, UK Gap, where companies are required to report on their financial information. And the CSRD will introduce a set of sustainability reporting standards, like the financial reporting standards, where companies have to report on their sustainability impacts. Uh, last but not least is the EU taxonomy regulation. And the EU taxonomy regulation is a uh, taxonomy that is used to define which economic activities qualify as sustainable. So you can see it as a, a long list of economic activities with criteria that decide whether your economic activities, such as wind power, but also manufacturing uh, or insurance activities are considered to be sustainable or not. Since the CHRD is impacting probably most of the companies uh, in the near future, that's the first regulation that I'll touch upon. Um, the CSRD requires companies to report on the impact of their corporate activities uh, on the environment and society, and also requires the audit of that information. So like similar to financial information where the auditor comes and reviews the information that's put in the annual report, this will also be applicable to the non-financial information. Um, the CSRD introduced those detailed reporting requirements, uh, including 137 KPIs to report on, which is definitely a challenge. 
um, I have to put a remark here that there are currently uh, discussions. So the, the CSRD and the ESRSs have not been fully adopted yet. So that will happen in the next few months. So there might be a few changes in the directive. However, we still expect there will be a significant extension from what's currently mandatory to report on non-financial information to what companies have to report on in the near future. Um, I think I, one of the questions I could imagine that people would ask is, but okay, but how does that impact me as an SME? Well, for listed SMEs, the reporting requirements will only be applicable as of 2026. And for non-listed SMEs, you don't have to report. You can choose to use those standards on a voluntary basis. However, companies investing in SMEs will likely have to comply with the CSRD much earlier. They will most likely ask SMEs to provide sustainability information as input for their reporting. This might create a challenge for you to provide the required data, all those 137 KPIs, but it also provides an opportunity to tell your sustainability story and to be noticed by impact investors. And this is also a topic that will be discussed during the panel session. So this is just a quick slide on where we explain the timing of those uh, requirements. Would you mind going to the taxonomy regulation slides? Yes. Just as an extra, I put this slide in there as well to talk about the EU taxonomy regulation to provide a bit more context on that regulation. So companies that are in the same scope as the uh, Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, they also have to disclose the extent of the taxonomy alignment of the activities and the investments. That means taxonomy alignment means how sustainable are my economic activities and are my investments. Um, and they have to assess that based on substantial contribution criteria and do not significant harm. And they do that for the uh, environmental objectives, social objectives and governance objectives that have been set. Well, so far, out of the six environmental objectives, a taxonomy has been created for the first two environmental objectives, which is climate change mitigation and climate change adaptation. And the companies that are subject to the CSRD will also have to report on how aligned their activities are with the environmental objectives, climate change adaptation and climate change mitigation. Um, in the near future, the taxonomy will be expanded to also cover the other four environmental objectives and also cover social and governance objectives. Um, but the first two are already enacted and companies already have to report on the first uh, set. And what we see in the market is that this regulation um, also activates companies, investors, to look at how sustainable their investments are and how taxonomy aligned their investments are. For instance, if a company um, uh, advertises themselves as being a green investor, but your taxonomy alignment is rather low, um, that does not really uh, communicate with each other, even though the taxonomy is rather limited at the moment. So what we see in the market is that investors are also starting to look at how taxonomy aligned the investor, investees are, they're starting to request data and information from their uh, investees to, um, to assess the taxonomy alignment and to be able to report on that. Well, I think the SFDR, the CSRD and the EU taxonomy are currently in the European Union the most important reporting regulations um, that either already have been adopted or will be adopted in the near future. Um, but we also have other regulations such as the, the CS Triple D, which is the Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence Directive that will uh, be adopted in the near future. With that, uh, I would like to end the part on EC regulatory developments uh, and see if there are any questions about this part of today's webinar. So feel free, feel free to post any questions you might have in the Q&A part. And afterwards, we'll move on to the to the panelists of today.
So I see a question from uh, Willeke Muno. Is the CSRD obligated for all small, small companies starting 2024? Um, well, fortunately not. Um, the CSRD will only be mandatory for listed SMEs starting 2026. And for um, SMEs that are not listed, the CSRD will not be mandatory. So you'll have an opportunity to apply voluntary the standards, but it's not mandatory to apply those. However, we do already see a rise in requests on data from investors, from financial institutions to SMEs to start reporting. Uh, so they can use it in their reporting. I see two questions from Marco Swan. Um, what are the biggest challenges for SMEs to decarbonize? Um, and also, how can SMEs best prepare for the regulatory developments? Uh, and I would like to save those questions for the panel session uh, of today. So I'll move on to a um, question from Jan Rudolfs, which is why was it chosen to focus on the environmental pillar? Um, the reason that the European Commission decided to focus on the environmental pillar is was, it was um, deemed to be most urgent to focus on climate change at the moment. So that's why they also chose to focus on two environmental objectives, climate change mitigation and climate change adaptation. I do expect that for the other remaining four environmental objectives, um, the taxonomy will be adopted rather soon. However, it seems that for the social taxonomy and for the governance taxonomy, there is some delay since they've already had quite some difficulty to really um, detail and implement the first six environmental objectives. Thank you for your questions. Um, if there are no other urgent questions at this moment, uh, I suggest that we move on to the panel section of today. I see one more question that I'll um, answer that from Edward van den Heuvel. Question for clarification. EU entities mean entities vested in the EU. That's correct. So, um, well, <laughs> to make it more complicated, um, every regulation has a different scope with respect to EU entities. So for the SFDR, it's about financial market participants and financial advisors that um, offer products in the European Union. Uh, and for the CSRD and the taxonomy, they have the same, they have a similar scope. Um, it's about uh, companies vested in the European Union, uh, but also for companies that have a um, subsidiary or a branch here with at least 150 million of revenue every year. So especially for the CSRD, um, if you have any activities in the European Union, I would recommend to look into the very detailed uh, requirements on which subsidiaries and which entities are in scope of the CSRD or not. Okay, thank you for your questions. Um, I suggest that we uh, move on to the panel session section of today's webinar. Uh, and the first panelist that we have today is Andrea van Dijk, ESG officer at InvestNL. Welcome, Andrea. Thank you for joining us here today. Would you like to start with a quick introduction of yourself? Yeah, sure. Thanks. Uh, happy to. Uh, well, as Evelyn said, uh, my name is Andrea van Dijk and I work for InvestNL. InvestNL is a relatively new firm. We were uh, established uh, in 2020. We're fully state owned by the Dutch government. And uh, what we want to do is making uh, investments in, uh, in the future of the Netherlands. Uh, and my role is ESG officer. And uh, I think I'll get to uh, the content of my role a bit later. <laughs> Thanks, Andrea. Um, 
as I understand correctly, you're responsible for developing invest in health ESG policy and also the implementation of the ESG policies in the, in the investment process, um, as well as ESG engagement monitoring strategy for the investment in health portfolio. Can you, can you tell a bit more about this? Like, what does it mean developing ESG policy, the ESG policy and uh, implementation in the investment process of invest in health? Yeah, sure. Um, so at Invest in L, um, yeah, we we are an impact investor. So um, and we invest in innovative startups and scale-ups. And our focus is very much on finding uh, startups or mostly scale-ups. So the ones that aren't completely new, but still building a, a technology or a product or a factory and need financing. And then our focus is on on technologies um, on products that help to. Uh, achieve a carbon neutral or a circular economy. Um, so think about uh, propositions that have uh, new technologies for um, uh, energy storage, for example, uh, more efficient batteries, um, companies that work in the solar field but do something completely new, um, but also uh, on, um, to some extent, we also have uh, a portion of our investments dedicated to healthcare and, and then propositions focusing on making healthcare more accessible and more affordable. So for us, the impact is, is front and center. And we also uh, have uh, linked that to SDGs, uh, mostly SDG 12, 13 and SDG 3. Um, but then my role as the ESG officer, I work very closely with um, our colleagues that make the impact assessment. And the impact assessments are uh, really focusing on what the company is making, uh, what are, um, for example, raw materials um, going into the process, what is the energy used during production, uh, what is the output, how does the product compare to a reference product, how can, for example, CO2 reductions be quantified. So it's quite a technical analysis uh, on the impact side. And then we also use um, product uh, life cycle uh, assessments. And my role there as the ESG officer is to complement hey, once we have established, okay, this is a clear positive impact case. This company is going to help us meet those really important objectives. Uh, we also want to be sure that the way uh, the company is run is also aligned with global standards, such as the global compact principles or the UN guiding principles. So once you uh, make a product that that is really um, yeah really promising for the future. Also look at how employees are treated, for example, how inclusive is uh, um, is 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 the management. Um, so we we want not only to find the right activities, but also make sure that those companies are run the right way, and that while scaling up, we try to challenge and support them in in becoming more mature, also in the the management of uh, of. ESG in the broad sense. Okay, yeah, so if I understand correctly, you first look at more the product or the, the activity, more the, the technology that they use, but the important part of the ESG assessment is also how do they run the company, how do they treat their employees, their stakeholders, so do not significant harm, how, uh, make sure that also all the other factors of ESG are treated correctly. Yeah, it's exactly that. And uh, uh, yeah, you also mentioned the EU taxonomy. It's one of the things we look at, for example, if we uh, have uh, companies in the renewable energy uh, industry, that if a company is, is doing something, um, for example, in the battery, battery sphere that we look, is this activity already uh, captured in the EU taxonomy? Is it aligned? For us, that um, is yeah, a really helpful signal to know, okay, um, there's there there's some uh, real significance in in the positive impact there, um, but we yeah we don't want to stop there. And what we see with uh, companies, especially younger companies that are laser focused on the impact, which is, I think, is fantastic. Um, then the the ESG policies around this are sometimes um, a lower priority. And I think at some point when companies reach a certain scale, uh, we want to put that a bit higher on the agenda. Yeah, I can imagine. So you, you mentioned that you're also asking for instance, uh, questions about the taxonomy alignment. I can imagine that you expect uh, or you request quite a lot of data from the SMEs to be able to assess um, the SDG alignment on how sustainable they are. 
what, what kind of um, data challenges do you run into or what kind of data challenges do the companies run into? Because I can so, imagine they don't have everything available readily. Uh, no, certainly not. Uh, when it comes to the EU taxonomy, uh, that's an assessment we do ourselves. So we look at what the company is doing and then we, we check that against uh, taxonomy criteria. It's something we do prior to investing, but in, in some cases the taxonomy uh, doesn't cover the economic activity. Um, for example, when, it, when something is related to agriculture, there are no criteria yet. So then we still have to uh, do our own impact assessment. Um, and beforehand, uh, yeah, we're asking for data. Ideally, um, uh, there is an LCA that, that would be made by uh, a third party, but sometimes uh, the entrepreneurs are still so early stage, they're still developing their prototype, they're still fine tuning their process, they're not even sure what materials they'll choose. So then um, an LCA is, is, uh, is not available. So the, the earlier the, the, the company in, in terms of development, uh, the harder it is to make good impact projections. Uh, so that is one of the challenges, but, uh, and sometimes we also postpone that and we really look at the concept and, and think, okay, what the really quantitative assessment will have to do maybe in a year or two. Um, then when, after the investment, we ask for uh, annual data from, uh, from the companies and those focus on uh, on energy consumption, on uh, production volumes, um, and based on that, we can uh, yeah we can also make our calculations on uh, what are CO two emissions, what is avoided CO two if applicable. We also ask for uh, information on circularity, so to what extent is the material used in the production process uh, bio based or recycled, and to what extent is uh, the product itself. Uh, recyclable or recycled uh, at end of life. So we, uh, that is a really challenging uh, aspect because it means uh, sometimes a different thing to different people and there are no really clear criteria that everybody is familiar yet. So circularity is a challenging one. We still, uh, we still ask where relevant. And then uh, the easy ones are uh, job creation. So F uh, the FTEs, um, in, uh, investments in, in R&D, so as a proxy for uh, innovation, and then uh, some gender equality uh, figures, for example, in senior management and, and board position. So overall, both at, uh, at the moment that you start investing as well as periodically, it's, it's quite a bit of information that you yeah. need yeah. And to be able to yeah. assess. And, and pre-investment is really in a conversation. We really also try to uh, nail down with uh, with the with the company what are, what is the impact objective of the company what is their theory of change what is it that they're try they try to to change what is the the challenge that their technology addresses uh, and then once we've ex established that we also uh, seek agreement with the company on the data that we collect on an annual basis and then uh, yearly we we ask for these figures um, we haven't uh, started asking for uh, all the data that is referenced in SFDR or uh, uh, CSRD yet, but I can imagine that, uh, um, well, I'm already seeing other investors asking for more data. So, uh, yeah, I think any company with, uh, with external investors, especially the ones that fall under the SFDR, will get more and more data requests in the coming years. Thank you. Um, you mentioned that InvestNL selected three SDGs themselves uh, itself. Um, do you consider yes. that if SMEs uh, <laughs> do you consider that if SMEs uh, also focus themselves on certain SDGs or report on SDGs that they have a bigger chance of being invested in? Well, Not necessarily by InvestNL, but maybe by other impact investors. I think I think it's definitely the case, and and not even if they brand it as such, or if they say, "Look, we contribute to SDG one, two, or three, or whichever SDG." I think maybe for some investors that would be already a positive thing. Um, but I think what uh, really helps if if it's the core of the activity, so it's the product or the service or the technology that the company is offering, in itself contributes to. Uh, for example, climate change mitigation or improved healthcare. 
I think uh, that is where, um, where I think those SMEs are really well positioned to find uh, impact focused investors. Um, if, if, if the product or service itself is generic and, and but the process is, uh, is very strong. Um, so in the way the company is run, it ticks a lot of boxes that definitely also goes a long way. And then uh, it's not necessarily impact focused investors, but investors with, uh, yeah, that care about ESG. Um, but when it comes to the SDGs themselves, I think those are mostly relevant for uh, impact uh, oriented investors. And there it's really about the core of the company and, and yeah. Um, so when, when thinking about where does my company contribute to the SDGs, maybe don't look at recycling the office papers. It's definitely something to do, but really focus on what is the core business of the company and to what extent does that contribute to any of the SDGs. Yeah, it's important to recycle your coffee cups. Uh, I have one here as well, yeah. <laughs> but it's probably not the where you make the most impact with your company. Typically not, no. No, and if I understand correctly, it's mostly about, I mean, focusing on SDGs and, and telling a story or being able to, to tell a story is beneficial, but it's mostly about really the core focus of the company. It's about- Yeah, and, and, and knowing about that. And, and I think similar, if, if uh, I think if a company knows that its activities are aligned with the EU taxonomy, I think it's a great thing to tell investors. I think that will really help. So really knowing that like your product or service or a business objective does support the SDGs is aligned with the EU taxonomy, being really clear on where you stand um, is, is helpful in conversations with investors, especially the ones with an impact focus and that investor base is growing because impact investing is really hot. You already mentioned a few developments like the CSD and SFDR that you expect that, that might increase the data requests from uh, investors to, uh, to invest in companies. Do you expect any other developments in the next few years that SMEs can already uh, look into or start thinking about to prepare themselves? Yeah, so for the companies that we're investing in, it's sometimes they're currently an SME, but they're growing um, because, uh, yeah, that's what we do, uh, making companies prepared for growth. And then at, at a certain point, they might reach the 250 employees and the, the related revenue figures and CSRD becomes applicable. So my advice would be once your SME company is a, like a, a really significant SME company, uh, and for example, you're close to the 250 employees, get yourself prepared for understanding what CSRD is about and what it is you need to report. And there, the sooner you already have integrated sustainability management systems early on, the easier it will be later on when it, when it becomes mandatory. Uh, so, yeah, I think for, for growing companies, CSRD is a really important development. I also expect that, um, I already mentioned, there will be more data requests. Eventually, that will also lead to more standardization in a data request. So right now, sometimes companies with multiple investors get multiple data requests from each shareholder, a different data request, or from each uh, financier, a different data request in a different reporting rhythm. And I, I think that is really challenging. Uh, once uh, there's more alignment uh, driven by legislation of what investors need to report, they will ask for more data, but I also expect that different investors will all ask for the same data. So on the longer run, I think things will probably be a bit easier. It probably will be, get a bit more difficult in the near future, but in the longer run, hopefully with alignment and with similar data requests, it will get easier. That's my expectation indeed, yeah. Thanks. Uh, any last words of wisdom for the SMEs in the audience regarding this topic? Um, yeah, I think uh, my last word of wisdom for, for SMEs in the audience would be to not aim for picking all the SDGs. So uh, focus on what matters for your business strategy. So 
it's you're not a better company if you if you claim to contribute to all 17 SDGs versus the ones that have really um, clarified that there are two or three SDGs that is where they really contribute. So focus uh, and and really find if you if you're not sure which SDGs you're contributing to, uh, find out where your core activities have a positive impact, but also see if there's any negative impact that you might be unaware of of your core activities on the SDGs. And uh, yeah, so looking at the posit positive and negative side of your core activities and find a focus. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that that would, uh, that would be my advice for SMEs trying to, to build a narrative around their purpose and uh, yeah, speaking to impact focused investors. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, that was very insightful. Thank you for your contribution. Um, we'll now have two other panelists. Uh, in the meantime, you're still uh, very much welcome to uh, post any Q&A in the, in the section. Uh, and we'll try to touch upon those uh, as much as possible after the panel uh, discussion. Um, so I suggest that we move on to Angela McEwen, a partner at Clifford and Chance. Good morning, everyone, and hello, uh, Evelyn. Lovely to be with you. Welcome, Angela. Thank you for joining us here today. Uh, would you like to introduce yourself? Um, yes, thank, thank you, um, Evelyn. So um, I'm a lawyer and um, a partner in the finance and capital markets team at Clifford Chance. Um, I'm an English qualified lawyer, um, and I'm based in our Amsterdam office. Um, I advise lenders and companies on their finance transactions. Um, and I do a lot in the ESG space in particular, um, including in relation to renewables transactions, um, but also with financings with a, a general sustainability focus. So as a result, I've done a, a lot of transactions uh, involving sustainability linked loans and also other loans with a green or sustainability focus. Um, I'm also on our firm's ESG board and I co-lead our European ESG board. Um, so great to be with you and discussing this really important topic. Thanks, Angela. Um, well, it's really nice to have you here because you uh, can explain, I think, a bit more about the, the market of ESG products, especially um, seen or provided by the lenders. So can you tell us a bit more about recent developments you've seen in terms of sustainability products provided by lenders? Yeah, absolutely, Evelyn. Um, indeed, so my work's more indeed on the product side in relation to loan agreements working with, with banks and companies. And I think what we've seen since really going back to even 2017 is that there's been a really a huge growth um, in the amount of sustainable uh, related financings. And maybe before I go into sort of details in terms of what we've seen, um, maybe just to touch on the terminology. There's often a lot of confusion when people talk about green loans they often mean that as it's kind of used as an umbrella definition, but it's actually quite important to distinguish between a couple of two main products on the finance side. Um, one is sort of true green loans. That's one where the proceeds of the loan must be used to finance a green purpose or project. That's sort of on, on one side. But the other one, and the more recent development, and the one that really uh, we've seen huge growth in, is something called sustainability linked loans. Um, so the important point here is that the proceeds of the loan don't need to be used for green purposes in themselves, um, but the loan will include a pricing adjust adjustment, um, which will enable the margin to be adjusted, there'll be a premium and a discount element, depending on whether or not the borrower achieves certain ESG-related KPIs, um, which will have been agreed between the borrower and the lenders. Um, at the time of entering into the facility agreements. Um, so this is the product that, although we're seeing a growth, of course, in all sustainability-related finance, it's really the sustainability linked loans that have been the ones that have been developing hugely, um, that really sort of gained favour with, with corporates that want to make a, a positive ESG impact, but without necessarily um, having the restrictions of having to use the proceeds um, to a green purpose. 
So you see this kind of product, these sustainability linked loans being used by a whole breadth of companies um, across various you know, sectors from manufacturing to publishing. There was no really limit on the type of companies that could you know, include this type of provision, as long as they are, of course, willing to agree appropriate ESG related KPIs, which can be built in to the pricing arrangements. Um, so the whole range of companies can can issue those sustainability linked loans. Um, I can imagine they do have some to have some sustainability nature. Those companies, because otherwise, it's difficult yeah. to uh, to agree on KPIs. Yeah. What what kind of KPIs are um, are they agreeing on? Yeah, so, so two points, Evelyn, just in, in terms of your first point about, you know, you assume there must be some connection also with the, with the business. And, and in, indeed, as this, and, and then we'll come on to what type of KPIs, um, as, this mar as this market's developed, there are also now more guidelines in it. So to start with, there was, you know, the, the, the product was much more flexible. Now, of course, um, people expect there to be much more scrutiny in terms of what sort of components should be included in one of these loans in order to call it a sustainability linked loan. Um, so guidelines have emerged from the Loan Market Association called the sustainability linked loan principles and the, the type of features that are really key to include uh, in order to be able to call it a sustainability linked loan, maybe to point out the main ones are there needs to be a relationship to the borrower's own CSR strategy. Um, so the borrower you know, of the sustainability linked loan should be able to clearly communicate to its lender its sustainability objectives and set out in its CSR strategy and how those align with the ESG related KPIs, which will then be built in to the loan agreement and to the interest related provision. So there does need to be a connection there that everybody understands, which of course does make sense. Um, the other thing, and coming on to your question um, in relation to KPIs, Evelyn, this is obviously becomes a bit more of a complex question and very much depends on, on, on the company in question. Um, the KPIs, the, the guidelines in relation to sustainability and loans, what they say in relation to the kind of KPIs is that they need to be ambitious, they need to be meaningful, um, and they should be able to be benchmarked. Now, what ambitious and meaningful means will very much depend on the type of companies. If you've got a company that's already very well progressed on its sustainability initiatives, there might be some things that you put as a KPI which are quite easy for that company, so they're not really ambitious. Um, whereas for another company that's much earlier on um, in its development and sustainability, there could be something that might look easy for one company, but for it, for this company in question, it's at the beginning of its journey and actually it's ambitious. So in other words, it, it would fall within that requirement that the KPI should be ambitious. So the key point is, whatever KPIs are set, they should be ambitious and meaningful and borrowers kind of need to discuss with the lenders, you know, what those are. I mean, what we are seeing is, and what we've seen more recently, is the emergence of uh, what's called often a sustainability coordinator on these transactions. Um, so this will often be a, a lender on the transaction. It will be a lender that sort of builds up some knowledge and, and know-how and, and wants to work together with the company um, to set you know, what may be ambitious and, and meaningful KPIs. Um, in terms of the type of items that we've seen included, just to include some real examples as well, I think when we first started to see this product emerging, um, we saw maybe some of the more predictable KPIs. So that would be KPIs that related to greenhouse gas, gas emissions. Um, energy efficiency um, was also very popular. And um, what we've seen more recently, and as the product becomes more sophisticated, and is actually companies also develop their own strategies on this much more, is we start to see much more bespoke KPIs being included in these transactions. So for example, and it often goes beyond the environment, so it goes into the S of the ESG, the yeah. social side of things. So it's not unusual as well as seeing um, KPIs that relate to things like you know, greenhouse gas emissions and energy efficiency. We also often see things like the number of women in senior management roles, um, you know, the sale of zero or low calorie drinks, um, the amount of sugar in drinks, um, the amount of cars in a car fleet, um, the instant rates in a workplace if it's a factory. So we see much more of a um, kind of an all-embracing ESG um, approach. 
as companies do indeed try and um, fit the KPIs they're included, including with the strategies that they're developing on both the environmental and the social side. Okay, so the market seems to be maturing from more of a uh, really startup phase where, where they're trying to figure out sustainability linked loans and maybe more standardized KPIs and greenhouse gas to a more bespoke tailored approach for the really the core business of the company, like the, the yeah. sugary drinks or the diversity. Yeah, exactly. And, and initially also on some of these products, you'd sometimes just see K, um, maybe one KPI included, which should be the measure as to whether the margin would be adjusted or not. Now what you see is more KPIs. You know, it's not unusual to see two, three, maybe four or five is more on the higher side. But, you know, companies are coming up with more and more ideas as to what they're trying to achieve and what they're including in their own strategies you know, and business planning. Um, so you just see the whole product becoming you know, more sophisticated, let's say, and more tailored. Um, I think the important thing is it, 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 there's nothing really standard in a way about it in that although you often see the same sorts of provisions, it's really important that it is tailored you know, to the individual company in question. Yeah. So we, we, you do make use of, for instance, LMA, um, standard terms and conditions, but the, what in the end is included is really tailored to the company. The KPI should really be meaningful, um, not boilerplate, yeah. but really be meaningful to really have an impact. Exactly. So, so typically the wording um, will often even be agreed, you know, at the term sheet stage and the KPIs will be agreed. Um, those discussions should typically already be taking place at the same time as the rest of the terms and the term sheet. So, it will be quite bespoke wording, but there are also lots of examples in the market. So you see the same types of provisions, but just variances between the different uh, companies. And do you also already see a development towards um, the European regulations, like the, the taxonomy regulation or the, or the CSRD or the public adverse impact indicators that are included in the SFDR? Are those data points that are, are starting to be included? Um, I think you mean in terms of setting the KPIs? Yes. Yeah, I can imagine that they would be. We've not necessarily seen that sort of de degree of it, you know, detail so far in terms of setting them, but there's no reason, of course. I think as, uh, that can't be the case as regulation develops and there are, as there are better benchmarks, let's say, benchmarking it in relation to particular sectors. I think that would make a lot of sense. I think it's just that the whole area is in a process of really emer you know, emerging, really, and constantly evolving. So I think we'll constantly see also this product, these products emerging and evolving, as also regulation um, sort of runs along and market practice also develops as well at the same time. Okay, thank you. Do, do you expect any other development specifically related to sustainability products in the near future? Um, I think we, we see them to continue to be interesting for lenders. They're a very standard feature on a lot of corporate loans. So I think that we, we expect, you know, we're still seeing that, that being the case. I think one thing will be um, as actually uh, the whole area becomes more sophisticated and there's more data available on it, um, I expect there may be more scrutiny as well that goes with that in terms of the KPIs which are being set. Um, in terms of things like uh, reporting. Um, so, for example, even if you look at the LME gave guidelines on these product sustainability link flows, um, and initially it wasn't necessarily, necessarily a requirement that there be external verification. Um, now that is seen as something that should be standard, that there should be external verification. Um, and I think this reflects that the market's becoming more sophisticated, there's more regulation, uh, there are more reference points for companies. Um, in ensuring that you know it's as meaningful as possible in terms of what's included. So I think there'll continue to be increased scrutiny and thought. Yeah. Thank you. Um, if, if we talk about increased scrutiny and, and increased regulations, how relevant will the European Commission proposals in relation to the, the mandatory environmental and human rights due diligence requirements be for companies? Yes, thanks for that question, Evelyn. So this is something completely different in a way. So that was we've been talking about products and loan agreements, and indeed this is more on the regulation side. Yeah. So I'm not specifically a regulatory lawyer, but actually just with uh, my involvement in ESG, this is very much a topic that's discussed a lot. So 
you know, the, the European Commission has proposed a directive on corporate sustainability due diligence, as you've mentioned. Um, that's been debated for quite some time. There's already been some quite intense debates on it, and I expect there will be quite some more. Uh, the important thing is still at proposal stage. It would still need to go through the European Parliament, and then there would be a period, of course, when, once it has been approved to be implemented in the individual um, in the individual member states. Um, but as with all of these things, time goes comes by very quickly. So I think it is very good that companies are already aware of that. I think maybe just to touch on the proposals briefly and why it could be important. I mean, the first thing, of course, is you know who are these um, who are these proposals likely to apply to which companies. Um, there's really main, three main categories. One is um, large EU companies, so that's say the companies with more than 500 employees on average and a worldwide um, net term, turnover of more than 150 million euros. There's then mid-sized EU companies um, in high, high impact sectors, they call them. So that's typically companies which are likely to be have um, about 250 employees on average and a worldwide net, uh, net, net turnover of more than um, 40 million in the previous financial year, provided that at least 50% of their net turnover was generated in one or more so-called high impact sectors. And then you also get falling within this likely scope of application, not just these EU companies, but also certain non-EU companies. So that's slightly to be non-EU companies um, with sort of net turnover, I think we're saying at the moment, of more than 150 million euros for the previous financial year, or EU generated net turnover of between 40 million and 150 million. So these provisions may change, but it gives you a little bit of a feel as to, okay, who, who do these apply to? Now, so if you're an SME, you might think, phew, this actually is not going to, yeah, I don't need to worry about this. And of course, I think it's thought that, you know, I think the European Commission had estimated earlier this year that the directive would be likely to apply to around, I think, 13,000 EU companies and about 4,000 non-EU companies. That's obviously a very rough estimate. Um, now, SMEs have been completely excluded from the scope, but I think the important point here and why it is still relevant for SMEs is that they may be exposed to the effects of the directive through measures which are taken by those companies which are in scope and which the SMEs do business with. So there's the whole supply chain thing and the fact that everyone's connected. Um, so that then comes down to, you know, what do these in scope companies that it applies to have to do? And there's going to be a number of you know, due diligence obligations, which will include, for example, you know, carrying out due diligence in relation to, you know, value chain operations and you know, in relation to entities which the companies have established business relationships with. So I think if you're an SME, you know, the important thing is, are you likely to fall within the scope? You know, you, you may feel that you don't, you know, you're not likely to fall within the large EU companies. Maybe you develop at some stage and fall within the mid-size EU companies, so fall directly within the scope of these due diligence requirements. But even if not, you can still be affected if you're doing business with a company. Uh, an EU or non-EU company put forth in the scope of these provisions. Yes, yeah, so it's, it's much like all the other regulations uh, that are mostly targeted towards larger companies. Yeah. SMEs will most likely also be affected since they are in the value chain. They are both upstream, downstream in the value chain. They will be affected since all those regulations more and more cover the full value chain rather than just target the company operations itself. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, I think from a company's perspective, you know, all those some people might think, oh, it's still a little bit of a way off in terms of these directives being implemented in member states. As I say, time goes quickly. And even if it takes two years, I think it already makes sense for companies to start being on top of these developments, you know, and start planning from a business perspective um, so that it's not suddenly upon um, everyone. Um, you know, when they are, you know, as they do come into force. Thank you, Angela. Um, do you have any uh, last words of wisdom for the SMEs in the audience? Um, yeah, I think it really was that thing just to, I, I think it was, it's overwhelming for a company, isn't it? All of the developments. I do think it's important to try and stay on top of them. I think, unfortunately, it's a really business imperative to do that. And some will be more relevant um, than others. 
Um, and I think it's planning ahead as well. I do think that's a big feature of it, even if something's not already there. What you do see in the EU is you see the pipeline of, of what is coming and what's going to affect other companies that we're doing business with. So I, I just think a bit of forward planning and getting the help that you need at an early stage will save you know, a lot of pain later and, and help sort of manage one's business um, in a good way. I think the positive thing is the market's very, you know, a lot of the market is, is obviously very involved in this whole topic. So that hopefully does mean there's quite a lot of engagements where needed and help can be obtained where needed. Yeah, so start soon, start in time, but there's help. Um, you can find help to, uh, to address all the questions and issues that you might have. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Angela. Thank you for the very interesting insights. Um, I'm sure I'll get back to you with a few audience questions during the Q&A session, no which is also a quick reminder for everyone, if you have any questions, you can put them in the Q&A section of the webinar, uh, and we'll try to address many, as many of those as possible um, at the end of this session. Um, with that, I would like to move on to Iris van Landroy. She's Program Manager CSR at MS Safety Footwear. Um, it's early morning for her because she's joining from New York uh, at the moment. Uh, maybe you can quickly introduce yourself and also tell a bit about what you're doing there at the moment. <laughs> Good morning, all. Yes, actually, still in the middle of the night here. <laughs> uh, I'm here uh, for the UN Global Compact, actually. Uh, I was invited by Senda Jembo, the CEO of uh, UN Global Compact, to come to the private sector forum on Monday, uh, which is a great event gathering uh, business leaders uh, around uh, yeah, the, the SDGs. And specifically, this theme was about uh, renewable energy. And also, uh, I was invited to come on stage because uh, I'm one of the SDG pioneers, which is a fantastic title <laughs> for, uh, yeah, it's, it's actually for people who have contributed to the SDGs. Uh, and of course, um, I've won the, the, the local round uh, with, with you here in the Netherlands, and uh, then I was also selected to be one of the 10 on the global round. So it's a fantastic honor. Uh, so they invited us to come on stage on Monday. Uh, it was, yeah, it was really an incredible experience um, that, to be there among these uh, leaders and um, also to hear about the uh, stories of the other SCG pioneers. And it was also a brilliant location with a rooftop bar and with nice view on Manhattan. So yeah, it, it was a great day. So, um, fantastic, yeah. Sounds good. And now an early morning. Indeed, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm happy to be here. <laughs> Thanks, Athena. It's great to have you here, uh, Iris, even though it's, it's quite early for you. Um, can you tell a bit about your role at MS Safety Footwear? What do you sure. do? I'm uh, responsible for the sustainability program at the EMMA, uh, and there I uh, work in projects uh, together with the, my colleagues, uh, of course, in, uh, for example, uh, making more use of sustainable materials in our collection, uh, but also uh, increasing, um, like improving the energy efficiency in the factory, making sure we uh, implement measures there also to decrease our waste, for example. Um, we have a take back program also for, for used footwear, the Circular Footwear Alliance, where I'm also in the, in the steering uh, committee. And then also uh, we have uh, communications around uh, the work uh, that we do, so including reporting, which you will uh, be talking about later on. Uh, also, um, and of course, the work we do in the supply chain, which uh, I got the uh, SDG uh, award for also. So it's uh, quite an intensive uh, and extensive program. Uh, and um, I'm uh, leading that uh, at Emma, and also I am responsible for sustainability uh, well, coordination at Hiltefors Group, which is our mother company. Uh, and uh, next to Emma, we have a few other safety footwear brands, and also we have some uh, workwear brands and tools and ladders. Uh, so um, it's quite a diverse group of brands that we have. And uh, here, more working on strategy and also sustainability reporting. Thanks, Iris. That, that seems quite a comprehensive role and also quite a comprehensive easy focus for all the for all the companies and specifically Emma. Um, so yes, since absolutely. we're talking about SDGs, what SDGs are you focusing on and, and why are these important for Emma? Well, um, 
of course, uh, we, we try to target as many SDGs as possible. I think it's especially important to um, do no harm on the other SDGs, but we mainly focus on uh, 8, 9, 10, and 12, where 8 is uh, about, uh, well, decent uh, work. Uh, so uh, that is for us uh, about uh, giving people an opportunity uh, who have a distance to the labor market, for example, uh, but also in our supply chain uh, that we uh, use, um, well, we, we have people uh, also um, uh, working in decent conditions. Uh, and then number nine is about uh, innovation for us. So uh, innovation in terms of materials, construction of the shoes, but also about reverse logistics, for example. And, and then um, again, number 10 is about reducing inequalities, for example, uh, gender equality, uh, but also um, uh, with, the, with the people uh, on board who, who need some more support. So we have job coaches internally who, uh, who support uh, the people at Emma. So we have about 63% of the people who have a distance to the labor market. Um, and number 12 is about um, well, sustainable production. So that's all the work that we do in our own factory. And also, the, the, for example, uh, applying recycled materials and more sustainable materials in our uh, collection. Yeah, so even though you, I mean, you try to not significant harm or harm at all any of the other SDGs, there are a few SDGs that are most important to you since that's really yeah. the core of the business. Yes. Thanks. And also, uh, if, if you look uh, at, at the impact, uh, we have done some um, life cycle assessments uh, recently, and you see that the impact uh, of our company is really with the materials that we use. So for example, with the polyurethane uh, that we use for the soles, the steel for the toe caps, for example, and, and the leather. Uh, so it's a little bit less about processes, transport, and, uh, and all the other aspects. So therefore this, these SDGs are really essential to us. Yeah, because it's really the core of the business, but it's also where you can make the, the biggest impact. Exactly, yeah. And you mentioned it's uh, it's about a lot about sourcing from uh, sourcing um, like the leather and the, the toe caps etc. Mm -hmm. Can you tell a bit more about your supply chain and due diligence efforts there? Sure. Um, so uh, we actually have our own specifications uh, which need to be signed by the upper supplier. So we determine which suppliers can be used, which materials can be used. We also state the exact composition of the materials. Uh, so that is uh, very important. To, uh, a little document for us uh, to even start the production. So it really starts in the design phase. Uh, it's also, um, uh, uh, we also have some compliance documents. For example, uh, we work in the platform World Favor, which is a sustainability platform uh, for your due diligence work. And there, our suppliers need to sign a code of conduct, uh, also a restricted substance list. Uh, and also some um, self-assessment questionnaires. Uh, so uh, we focus on the 70% spend that we have uh, when it comes to audits. So they um, need to either have an audit standard uh, or they need to do an audit in case they don't have any. Um, so um, yeah, that for, again for us is a, a tool to do to check whether they also comply with our code of conduct. And the same goes for the RSL. They, they need to sign uh, the RSL, but we also do uh, an annual um, check on, on the most important risks so, so that we also know that, uh, that they comply um, with the RSL. Um, so for example, we did a test uh, uh, recently and it showed that we had a too high concentration of leads in the, in the toe caps and also uh, some BPA in our eyelets. Uh, so these were restricted to restricted chemicals for us. So then also we, uh, we of course, uh, got in touch again with our suppliers and asked them to immediately improve this and they did so. So this is very important work for us to, uh, to reduce risks in our supply chain. And it's not easy because uh, of course we, we have like hundreds of suppliers, like we have bigger suppliers, but also suppliers um, who make like a counter for, for a, a, only a few styles of shoes. And the further you get in the supply chain, the more difficult it becomes because the less leverage that you have. Um, 
and in the past we used to produce our own shoes so that's a whole different story and and now we produce uh, the soles uh, in our own factory and we have an assembly uh, part in our own factory only so it's uh, it's quite a difficult task but it's a very important task so uh, that's why we're doing it yeah i can i can definitely uh, imagine and it's if i understand correctly it's not just about getting the data but also about engaging um oh yes yeah they are the experts engaging the, the the value chain and, and also helping yeah. them in uh, yeah yeah for, for sure and uh, yeah they they are the experts in their field so it's very important to keep on challenging them uh, also and uh, to to make sure that they make progress and sustainability so and and this is one way of of tracking that so uh, yeah it's a very important uh, task yeah so you put a lot of time and effort in the supply chain and also getting data from the supply chain, uh, but you also uh, have to report yourself, right? On the ESGs, mm -hmm. on SGs, yeah. KPIs, etc. How did you select the KPIs to report on and how do you measure and track progress? Uh, most of our KPIs were selected by our uh, investor, uh, which is Latour. Um, they are a Swedish-based company and they have uh, already given us some minimum requirements uh, and they, these relate to uh, business ethics, uh, for example, the percentage of code of conduct signed, um, but also uh, environment, for example, uh, at, at least reducing 5% of uh, CO2 emissions in scope one and two every year, um, and also on, on governance. Um, so most of these we get from them, but we also have some additional ones for ourselves, for example, percentages of recycled content that we use in our shoes and also the, the number of collection points for return shoes. So um, we really see these as, as minimum requirements, uh, but most of them we got, uh, got from our owner. Um, and how we keep track of those, uh, well, for example, uh, uh, World Favor is the program that we use for our own uh, reporting. So we do this quarterly and annually. So every quarter we report, report for example, on uh, accidents uh, in, uh, in the factory, uh, on uh, the emissions of our cars, uh, on the gas usage. Uh, so there are a lot of various KPIs that, that we report on. And these are also based on the Global Reporting Initiative. Thanks, Iris. Um before we move on to the Q&A section of the webinar, do you have any um, last words of wisdom for the SMEs in the audience? Um, well, I think it's very important to, to get started. Um, and in, yeah, but what maybe help is start with a materiality assessment or a risk assessment uh, in your supply chain so you know where to focus on. Um, and also, yeah, j j just stop talking and, and start doing because there, there's a lot of talking <laughs> uh, in, in this sustainability world. Uh, and um, it's fair, but it's also very important uh, to, to explain your problems and challenges and progress to others because um, some organizations decide to only communicate um, when, it, when, when they have a perfect situation. Uh, but we started to communicate quite early on, uh, and that really helped us uh, to improve ourselves and, you know, to, to get feedback and right contacts from from people. So uh, I think that that's really uh, worthwhile to do so as well. Thanks, Iris. Thank you for the for those uh, the wisdom. <laughs> um, that concludes the panel discussion. We can't hear you anymore, Evelyn. Sorry, I think I've muted myself. Uh, uh, what I want to say is that it concludes the panel's discussion of today's webinar, and then we'll now move on to the Q&A um, from the audience. We've already received uh, quite a number of questions. And the first question I would like to ask to Andrea, and the question is, is regulation an extra hurdle for investments, or do you consider it to be an opportunity? Um, yeah, I think a uh, great question. Uh, I think it's both. Uh, the part that makes it easier for us, for example, is that the EU taxonomy provides a really objective reference. So for us, deciding whether an investment is green enough, the EU taxonomy is really helpful. 
And what is also helpful for us as investors is that there will be more data in the market because more companies will be asked to report. So those are great. Um, what is harder is the way the uh, re uh, regulation is implemented in bits and pieces with changes all the time. So really understanding the regulations uh, already asks a lot of energy that doesn't go to sustainable investments. Um, and so there's there's big market confusions and, and, and that is that is detracting. So it, it it's both at the same time. Thanks, Andrea. Um, I also have a question for Angela, um, and the question is, do you expect um, any differences or, or do you see, do we expect larger differences in developments between the UK market and the European mainland market? Thanks, thanks, Emily. Um, yeah, that's a difficult one to say, isn't it? I think if I take Europe as a whole, and let's include the UK for these purposes, they're really, that whole Europe, Europe region, uh, EU and the UK, have really been leading the way on a lot of developments in relation to ESG and sustainability, you know, when you actually look at other regions that are sort of now sort of catching up. It's difficult to say that one is, is faster than the other. The UK is also actually been very much on top of the developments around ESG and, and regulation and the EU has been as well. I couldn't really sort of say between them um, whether one's ahead of the other, but I think that they are both doing, both areas are, are doing sort of really great things, I think, in, in, in trying to push the agenda on it from the local perspective. Thanks, Angela. Um, I also have a question for um, Iris um, about supply chain tr transparency. So in mm -hmm. case you encounter a lack in supply chain transparency, what do you suggest to tackle, to tackle this difficulty? Uh, thank you. Uh, we uh, uh, immediately engage with our suppliers and it's in important for us to keep uh, on having uh, regular contact uh, with them. So also we, we visit our suppliers regularly, of course, to, to prevent uh, risk, but also um, yeah, the, to talk about their challenges and and like for example, what we have done recently with the RSL is yeah, immediately engaging also our upper supplier and uh, also then the supplier like a second or third uh, tier supplier. Um, we immediately go into conversation and in the past we have uh, also ended the relationship uh, because the circumstances were were. Yeah, well, that disastrous at, at that was just too far from our values. Um, but we only really do that if it's yeah really in, in a possible situation. We try to avoid that because the suppliers also need to have some room to uh, improve. Thanks, Iris. Um, there's a question, um, it might, I might pick it up myself, this question, and it's to what extent are the CSRD data requirements aligned with the SDGs? So the CSRD data requirements cover um, environmental, social and governance, uh, and they're inspired by the SDGs, but they do not necessarily, there's not necessarily a direct link between the 17 SDGs and all the data requirements included in the CSRD. Um, and then I have a question. Um, I'll just I'll just put a question out there, and and and, and either Angela, Andrea, or Iris, uh, let me know who would like to answer this question. Uh, and that is, how can SMEs best prepare for the regulatory developments? Anyone of you want to take the stage? Yeah, I can give it a try, but I'm also very curious about what Iris has to add there. Uh, I think uh, the, the most important thing is, is uh, understanding what is applicable. Uh, so if, if, if a CSRD is, uh, is applicable to you, to your company or to your company in the next couple of years, if you have uh, growth ambitions. Um, and then, um, Probably, in, if you have uh, external investors that are subject to um, regulations, 
uh, have a conversation with them to what extent their data requests uh, will evolve in the coming time. Um, and then on the supplier side, um, I'm, I actually want to pass that one on to Edith. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, so what is a big one is the HRDD, the, the human rights due diligence uh, for us. Uh, that's why we, we do the work uh, in supply in our supply chain uh, today. That That's also um, yeah why, why we started to do audits, for example, and we joined um, uh, the textile um, covenant a few years ago, which ended in 21. Uh, but it, it was there that we already started to, to work uh, with, uh, with due diligence uh, work. So uh, that is a very big one for us. Um, with our Circular Footwear Alliance, we are already investigating where, whether we can uh, create our um, own EPR. Like, for example, for textiles, there's the, the EPR that is coming up. That's the extended producer responsibility. Well, we, we would like to also create one for the, for the shoes industry. So we are already in touch with also some competitors. And the alliance is already with one competitor uh, to really uh, well uh, see if we can uh, actually make a foundation uh, whether we uh, are able to, to set out the, the rules uh, so ideally you would like every customer to pay a, a small fee for uh, for recycling shoes uh, in the end uh, so for us that is a very important one and also preparing for CSRD uh, through for example uh, webinars but also um, yeah, taking on um, uh, the, the GRI uh, guidelines, or because we expect that, well, at least so, some of those will be in line with CSRD, uh, well, at least to a great extent. Uh, and also uh, our partner, World Favor, is also, um, uh, for example, uh, giving webinars on, on CSRD and what, what's coming also uh, for us. Uh, but I must say it's still an early stage for us. Uh, and uh, I think it will mostly also uh, in at this stage affect our uh, owner uh, and, and uh, as they also had to uh, comply with the NFRD uh, before. I hope that answers your question. Thanks, Iris. Welcome. Um... There's one last question. Uh, there's time for one last question in the Q&A. Um, I'll just I'll just put it out there again and see if who who would like to uh, answer. And that is, what are the biggest challenges for SMEs to decarbonize? Is that something that's on your agenda? Um, and what are the biggest challenges that you see there? Shall I start? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, for us. Um, it's, uh, of, it's actually uh, the mindset of the, of the uh, consumers also. Um, at the moment, they are not willing to uh, pay a premium price for more sustainable materials, which makes it quite difficult for, for us at the moment. Um, and uh, yeah, I would say that's, that's quite an important struggle. The, the technology is mostly there, but all the investment costs that you need to make to make certain products are all ending on the on, on the pioneers, uh, so that makes it very difficult for us. And also for us, uh, another challenge is the safety standards. And we always need to comply with uh, with safety standards, so we cannot just use any uh, more sustainable uh, material in, in our shoes. That like safety always goes first, comfort always goes first. Uh, so um, that that is for us. Uh, the, well, I wouldn't say uh, it, it's impossible, <laughs> but it makes our lives a bit uh, more difficult, yes. Thanks, Ihes. Any additions uh, by Andrea or Angela? Yeah, what, uh, uh, what I can add is looking at the companies in our portfolio, um, Typically, their uh, their their uh, products or or technology is aimed at decarbonizing, um, and also some uh, looking at circular material use. But I think there the um, yeah the doing something new 
uh, that doesn't fit in uh, existing legislation or permits, I think is, is challenging. Uh, like what Emma mentioned on the safety of the material, I think when it's about um, uh, something uh, yeah, related to food, there are all types of, uh, of uh, standards and regulations. You cannot just use any waste material to make something new. So I think uh, a, ch a challenge there when it comes to, uh, when it's about decarbonizing your material use is that the current legislative setup doesn't really cater for that yet. Um, let's hope that changes uh, in the coming time. Thanks, Andrea. Um, given the time, I suggest that we conclude the Q&A section of today's webinar and, and then we'll move on to Linda for the closing remarks. Uh, thank you, uh, Evelyn. Uh, that was a really interesting uh, discussion. Uh, I hope it gave uh, a lot of inspiration for, for SMEs to, uh, uh, and also uh, all the companies in, in, in their value chain uh, uh, to see it as a, as a joint challenge uh, to, um, uh, to move forward uh, uh, on the SDGs. A few observations um, after the discussion I have. Um, uh, as a SME company, I don't think uh, that the regulation that is uh, that will be introduced uh, soon that it's not it doesn't apply to you, so that it won't be relevant for you, uh, because you are part of of a value chain and investors, other companies in your supply chain will also ask uh, data and also will ask progress on your side. Uh, also, I think it's not the right um, uh, mindset, uh, growth mindset as an SME company, because maybe in the future you will grow and you will have, uh, you will be in the scope of this regulation and you will, will have more employees uh, than, for example, uh, 250 employees. So uh, that's one. Uh, the other uh, observation is the importance of um, uh, uh, of data, yeah? so you also be sure that you have the right data available uh, and that you will make it transparent. Uh, it will be a challenge, uh, but it is important. Uh, as a, a global compact, we will help you also with that. Uh, we have a new format uh, for the communication progress. So in the communication progress, uh, when you commit to the global compact, you also have to upload every year your, uh, uh, your progress in the communication progress. Uh, we will, uh, the, the format will be changed. It will be a digital platform, uh, but we, that will also help you uh, with, the, with the right uh, questions and elements and, um, uh, that are important uh, to, 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 uh, to make the, uh, your data ava available and transparent. Um, uh, a third observation, uh, it's important to, uh, to set uh, the right, uh, right KPAs, uh, KPIs and uh, also uh, tailored for, uh, for your company. Um, uh, thanks everyone. Uh, before uh, closing this, uh, this webinar, um, uh, a call to you. <laughs> Tomorrow we will celebrate uh, the uh, uh, um, the anniversary of the of the Sustainable Development Goals. It's the seventh anniversary. We are going to do that by raising the uh, uh, SEG flag. Um, we still have SEG flags in our office, so come to uh, <laughs> to the Hague and also. Uh, be sure that you uh, you can uh, raise the flag together with us uh, uh, and show your commitments to the sustainable development goals. Um, um, after uh, this webinar, we will send you a follow-up email also uh, with the, uh, the, the right documents and we have to be referred to. Um, and I hope it can, we gave you the, the right inspiration to, uh, uh, to move forward and maybe you will be the next SAG pioneer and you will be on the stage of the general, in the uh, General Assembly week uh, next, next year as uh, Iris did, uh, Iris did uh, uh, last year. Uh, I can recommend to, uh, it. <laughs> exactly. Uh, uh, thanks uh, to our partner, uh, NBCC, uh, it was great to organizing this webinar together. Uh, thanks to the panelists, uh, uh, Angela, Iris, Andrea, uh, thank you for sharing uh, um, uh, all uh, interesting uh, insights. And uh, thank you, Evelyn, for uh, uh, moderating the panel discussion and for your introduction. And uh, thanks everyone uh, for joining this webinar.